Well, um, good morning, uh, Mr. President of the, uh, the Institute. There, there you, uh, there you are, Excellencies, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Um, let me start uh, to say to you, uh, Dr. Williams, that we are very, very grateful for all the work you did for uh, the seminars and the ceremony last uh, yesterday. Um, I think um, I congratulate you and, of course, your, uh, your staff for the beautiful intellectual input and organizational input, of course, of the day of, uh, of yesterday. Um, and it's great uh, to see uh, such an, uh, well, important lineup of panelists uh, during uh, today, like yesterday as well, during, uh, during the seminar we had in the, uh, in, uh, the Peace uh, Palace. Great to see here uh, Hans Corell. Well, we, uh, we had a lot of uh, discussions in the, the old times with the Secretary General uh, to see an old friend from the Netherlands, Ad Melkert very important uh, uh, envoy for, uh, for the UN, uh, and he will have a beautiful contribution without any doubt uh, this, uh, this afternoon. It's great to have you, Judy Cheng Hopkins. You were yesterday, had a perfect uh, introduction during the seminar we had uh, yesterday in, uh, in the afternoon, and it's great you're here, and all those who uh, took the time to be here during this uh, seminar, you could say, uh, the day after. Um, I th I th well, we had the, the, the ceremony yesterday, the official ceremony was great, with uh, many members of the Dutch cabinet, uh, the king, and of course the secretary general. And uh, I think, uh, and I said it yesterday evening during uh, our reception at uh, the atrium in, in the city hall, I think uh, he uh, held a forceful speech yesterday. Uh, I said to a few, I never heard, I can, can tell it here as well, I never heard him so clear, clearer than ever, about uh, a very, very difficult international uh, situation. It was a forceful intervention, and I hope that that intervention will be heard in uh, the capitals of, uh, of the world and especially, of course, in um, Washington. Uh, because throwing, throwing away uh, international law, the Charter of the United Nations, sidelining uh, the Security Council is absolutely a wrong signal. So I think what uh, the Secretary General yesterday said was very, very important just uh, at the right time and of course, we were lucky, it's maybe difficult to say it in these circumstances, but that that message came from the city of The Hague, city of uh, peace uh, and, and justice. Two beautiful seminars, one organized yesterday, one organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the other by uh, the, Hague, uh, the, the Hague Institute. And uh, we ended yesterday evening with Alle Menschen werden Brüder, Beethoven's Ninth, and that was uh, a beautiful end of a successful uh, day. Well, we are uh, honoring and uh, celebrating 100 years of, uh, of Peace Palace uh, uh, these days, and we are honoring uh, Andrew Carnegie, the man who made the building, of which we are so very proud, and the symbol of the city of, of, uh, of The Hague, he described it as the temple of peace. And 100 years later, Carnegie's philanthropy and true dedication to, uh, to serve peace uh, is, I am sure that I can say that here without any hesitation, is an enormous inspiration to us all. His ambitions are our ambitions, his ideals are our ideals. And thus it was more uh, than symbolic, I think, that early this year in the Hague related foundations we had the groundbreaking for a building which has been called the Peace Palace for the 21st century, the building, the start of the building of the International Criminal uh, Court. It's right that we joyfully 
uh, celebrate what has been achieved over the last 100 years. But in my view, and I said it yesterday as well, it is a moment to reflect as well. The international situation is serious. The challenges we, we face today uh, are more complex than, than ever. We can see the birth of new conflicts and the resurgence of old ones. And these bitter struggles spread death and destruction and yield nothing but devastation, upheaval and instability. And how to break this vicious circle. I strongly believe, and the city strongly believes, the, the municipal council and the city administration strongly believe that the expertise of the many international organizations that are based here in the city of The Hague can be effectively marshaled to provide support to countries on the brink of conflict or to provide support to, to countries emerging from, con from conflict in the post-conflict situation and trying to assist them in establishing a rule of law. It is, uh, well, for this reason that the city of The Hague endorsed and endorses the Institute and commissioned uh, the Institute presided over by Dr. Williams and the partner, the Van Vollenhove Institute, to consider the key elements of initiatives that have supported conflict-affected countries in helping to bring about sustainable peace. A team of researchers uh, examined three uh, prominent cases, Afghanistan, Libya, and uh, Iraq, and I commend you to read anyway, well, all the reports, of course, especially uh, the report of um, Mr. Scott Carlson about Iraq, especially the Iraq element of the report. Yesterday, I said to you, I'm grateful that you are here as well. That is a breathtaking report, because, the, well, the, the, the unbelievable fact that expertise was sidelined in the Iraq case uh, has been described in a beautiful and very clear way in this report and it is uh, a lesson that can't be ignored especially uh, in uh, in these uh, these days the analytical uh, reports uh, which are the more of the background of uh, of the the Hague, uh, the Hague approach uh, which um, is encapsulated in, in six uh, principles. And they are, uh, in my view, to speak here more or less personally <laughs> as, as well, a groundbreaking uh, contribution to the field of peace building and they offer policy makers and the workers on the ground guidance for future, future operations in post-conflict environments. And they are a fine example of the combination of theory and practice of the main, one of the main characteristics of the De Hague Institute. As the president always says, it is a think and a do tank. And that's, that, 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 make, that makes a, a difference between many think tanks that there are in the world and the De Hague Institute for Global Justice. Take, for instance, what we did for Libyan uh, judges. It was great to have the Libyan Minister of uh, Justice and the Libyan Minister uh, of Afghanistan yesterday present do during the seminar we had. All six principles stress the importance of establishing and maintaining a close working relationship between the international actors and they stress the particular, fo they stress and have, have a particular focus on the, the enormous importance of prevention where the role of the United Nations, the role of the Secretary General, the role of the Security Council, of course, is a key, are key instruments. Network response is very important, as well as the engagement of the, uh, the private uh, sector. And finally, the De Hague approach underline the role of the, the strategic communication, a real communication and not just PR for operations but real communication and the international community very important of responsibility to learn the need uh, of of all the activities based on led by local actors 
and based on local knowledge, not ignoring local justice. Global justice, local justice should go hand in hand. That's difficult, but it is an, is an, is an important uh, factor. Because in the end, the solution should not come from the outside, but from the inside in conflict zones. Reconstruction cannot be imposed upon a nation. That's a lesson we've learned over the past years as well. And sustainable recovery needs to come from within, from men, and in my view, especially from women. They must be the makers of their own fate and their own future. Well, I referred to it yesterday already. A few of you have heard it, of course. But um, I think uh, we can say that uh, our, our, uh, Andrew Carnegie would have endorsed the De Haag uh, approach. He was a man in many ways ahead of his uh, times. In a newspaper interview in 1904, he said that by the year 3000, the world would realize that the founding of the Permanent Court of Arbitration had been the greatest gift to mankind. Carnegie was an, um, an idealist, but he was a realist as well. And I think uh, it's up to us to follow his example and to be realistic idealist, never allowing ourselves to be uh, overcome by cynicism or indifference. No matter how abhorrent a situation is or may become. And yesterday, and I will do it today again, uh, because our beautiful lines, uh, the poet is beautiful, I refer to the British poet John Macefield, who wrote, I've seen flowers come in stony places. And I sincerely hope that the De Haag uh, approach will further our uh, common goal. And of course, all the institutes, UN, EU institutes here in The Haag, and that peace will indeed flourish in the most stony of places. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for the warm welcome on behalf of the city of The Hague. Uh, since I arrived at The Hague Institute as its first president this January, I've always been able to count on the steadfast support of your office and of course your own personal guidance. Uh, there is no greater example uh, of this than the collaboration on the important body of work on peace building. And as you mentioned, yesterday marked the launch of the Hague approach comprising studies of rule of law and peace building in Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya as well as the six guiding principles for achieving sustainable peace in post-conflict situations. So I would really like to thank uh, the City of The Hague for its support for this project. And I look forward to debating the findings <laughs> of this research, which you will find in your packets. This is what it looks like. Um, and we will debate it over the course uh, of the day. And I can say uh, they're quite digestible, unlike some of the products one will find from think tanks. They're very digestible. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to bid you a personal welcome to the Hague Institute. Uh, as the mayor uh, mentioned, I'm always fond of saying that this is a young and vibrant think and do tank uh, with a singular opportunity to undertake cutting edge research, convene experts, and facilitate practical trainings on issues at the intersection of peace and justice. This focus befits our home in The Hague, which hosts a unique constellation of courts, tribunals, and international organizations, and will benefit enormously from our links with this community. The Institute's work on conflict prevention, rule of law, and global governance has application to policymakers here in the Netherlands, but also across Europe and in international organizations, governments, and NGOs. The topic of peace building is, of course, of critical importance to the Hague Institute's work 
and our work in this field draws on insights from across our programmatic activities. Conflict prevention is at the very heart of successful efforts to achieve sustainable peace. For what marks the failure of a peace-building effort if not the recurrence of conflict? Fostering the rule of law is critical to long-term stability and prosperity, but a rule of law culture emerges not from adherence to codes and procedures, but from genuine respect of the wider citizenry, citizenry to the principles of legal supremacy and equality. And as the number of actors involved in post-conflict situations expand and change, as rising powers question the legitimacy of institutions which have traditionally authorized and coordinated peace-building activities, there is a clear need for innovative research into emerging global governance mechanisms. Conflicts incur enormous costs, human, economic, and political. And while the world is in many respects a more peaceful place than it has ever been, millions of people still suffer the devastating effects of deadly conflict, as the tragic situation in Syria reminds us anew. Whatever course the international community may take in the coming days in Syria, the ultimate objective must be to serve the aspiration of the Syrian people for a stable, prosperous, and just society. Indeed, wherever conflict rages or threatens to rear its ugly head, concerted strategies are needed from those with the means to effect change. Ensuring that peace is not a fleeting promise, but rather a lasting proposition, remains an urgent challenge. Peace building has come to mean different things to different people, but has increasingly galvanized international efforts in post-conflict situations. Today's discussions will largely focus on efforts to build sustainable peace in the wake of conflict, Drawing from the definition used by the UN Peacebuilding Support Office, headed by Judy Chen Hopkins, and this definition I think is clear and helpful. Peacebuilding involves a range of measures targeted to reduce the risk of relapsing into conflict by strengthening national capacity at all levels for conflict management and to lay the foundations for sustainable peace and development. This conference provides an important opportunity to take stock of efforts to build sustainable peace as well as a chance to reflect on future developments in the field. We are fortunate to have with us today some of the world's leading experts on this subject as moderators and speakers. They have traveled from far and near and we are grateful to them. We're also privileged to have a knowledgeable audience so I look forward not only to fascinating interventions from the stage, but also to the dialogue that I hope will take place throughout the day. I hope that together we can generate new ideas to inform our collective peace-building efforts. The conversations will take place in this room, but also with your help beyond it, and I therefore invite you to share your reflections on Twitter, I think using hash Achieving Peace, uh, which is on the screen. But I do ask you, however, that you silence your mobile phones. Um, uh, before the day's discussions begin, however, I have the great pleasure of introducing today's keynote speaker, Hans Corell, uh, my former UN colleague. Hans served as Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and the Legal Council of the United Nations from March 1994 to March 2004, a role in which he led the UN's Office for Legal Affairs. And if I'm not mistaken, if my history of the UN serves me right, I think you are the longest serving of the, of the Legal Council, so close, yes. As Under Secretary General, Hans was intimately involved in the establishment of many of the international courts, 
including the ICC, which are now a feature of life in this city and the international legal order. His tenure at the United Nations followed a highly successful career in the Swedish Foreign and Justice Ministries. Hans received his law degree from Uppsala University and also holds honorary degrees from Stockholm University and Lund University. Hans has published widely, including on the, role, on the rule of law, on which he's a leading international authority. I can think of no one better to begin the substantive portion of today's proceedings and to reflect on the paramountcy of the rule of law in peace building. Hans, I invite you to take the stage. Mayor Van Hudson, President Williams, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank uh, the um, Hague Institute for Global Justice for inviting me to speak today. It's always a pleasure to come to the Hague intellectually, friendliness, old friends, and also the spirit in the discussions that I always meet here. So I'm looking forward to today. The topic of our discussion here today is achieving sustainable peace building, retrospect and prospect. During the course of the day, we will hear about lessons learned from UN peace building, the challenges and obstacles of democratic peace building, the role of civil society in peace building, the cases of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, and the role of regional organizations, the role of private sector, and the future of the global peace building architecture. I have been asked to address uh, the topic, the role of the rule of law in achieving sustainable peace building. In my brief keynote address, I will focus on three elements, three points. A few words about what we mean by the rule of law. The rule of law as the common denominator in peace building and the United Nations and the rule of law. I will conclude with a few reflections on the situation on everybody's mind at present, the state of affairs in Syria and the failure of the United Nations Security Council to address this situation properly. With respect to the first question, what we mean by the rule of law, I believe that it is appropriate to start by making a reference to the definition that uh, appeared in Secretary General Kofi Annan's report in 2004 on the rule of law and transitional justice in conflict and post-conflict societies. There, the rule of law is defined as follows a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. It requires as well measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness and procedural and legal transparency. There are also other definitions. One that is close to my heart, because I'm involved in this, is formulated by the World Justice Project, which leads a global movement to strengthen the rule of law for the development of communities of opportunity and equity. They actually had the fourth forum here in The Hague uh, about a month ago in July. Fantastic experience. According to the World Justice Project, the rule of law is a system in which four universal principles are upheld. First, the government and its officials and agents, as well as individuals and private entities, are accountable under the law. Number two, the laws are clear, publicized, stable and just, are applied evenly and protect fundamental rights, including the security of persons and property. Number three, the process by which the laws are enacted, administered and enforced is accessible, fair and efficient. And the fourth, justice is delivered timely by com competent, ethical and independent representatives and neutrals who are of sufficient number, have adequate resources 
and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. Among the different activities that the World Justice Project is involved, they have developed the Rule of Law Index. In this index, these four principles are actually further developed into nine factors. And if you have not done so, I recommend that you visit the World Justice Project's Rule of Law Index, which is easily accessible on the web. And by the way, I will send my keynote speech uh, to Abby Williams tomorrow. It will be on my website, so don't worry. There will be active links to this, the references I make. The latest issue actually results, presents results on 97 countries accounting for more than 90% of the world population. So it's a very interesting thing, especially the spider diagrams where you see in at a glance how a state is performing in the rule of law context. As for me, I've constantly argued that four elements are necessary to achieve the rule of law. Very simply put, number one, democracy. Number two, proper legislation meeting relevant international standards. Number three, the institutions to administer this law. And number four, the most difficult of them all, individuals with the necessary knowledge and integrity to run these institutions. With respect to my second point, the rule of law as the common denominator in peace building, let me suggest the following point of departure. Coming originally from judiciary in my country, Sweden, and ending up as the legal counsel of the United Nations, I'm of the firm conviction that looking at conflicts around the world, the common denominator is the same. No democracy, no rule of law. While these elements are absent, the potential for conflict is always present. Let me say for the sake of clarity that we should in no way believe that all is well in states where there is democracy and the rule of law. Unfortunately, this is not so. The rule of law must always be defended. It is a constant process that in a sense will never be completed. It is also important to remind ourselves that the process which has led these countries to where they are has been a very long journey indeed. Democracy and the rule of law have to be developed from the grassroots level. And here there must be a general understanding in a country that these components are necessary to create a system under which people can live in dignity. We should also remind ourselves that even democracies and states under the rule of law can fall out of the framework. A sad example is the development that led to the Second World War. The events in Europe during the last century should serve as a constant reminder that also highly developed societies can go astray. The unbelievable and unprecedented atrocities that were committed at that time were orchestrated by leaders who came to power through democratic processes. If we now turn to peace building, by definition we are faced with a situation where there has been a conflict precisely because of lack of democracy and the rule of law. Since these elements are necessary to build peace, the daunting task is to develop democracy and the rule of law in situations that are extremely volatile. Developing in democracy and the rule of law is not something that can be done overnight. On the contrary, as I just mentioned, in the countries where these elements are present, they have been developed over very long periods of time. It is also important in, uh, to bear in mind that one size fits all does not work here. Outside actors, be they representative of states, international organizations, the business community, or the civil society, should naturally engage and assist in various ways. However, it is important to be aware that national traditions and customs may be critical factors in this context. Here, it is important to make a clear distinction. This argument, national traditions, is often used by leaders who realize that they will be out of power if human rights standards were applied in their country. But it can also be advanced with reference to local traditions which may have served the society well until unscrupulous dictators and warlords destroyed that delicate system. I've had the privilege of discussing 
this with traditional chiefs in Africa. At the same time, there could be parallels with other countries, even between countries that may be far apart, but culturally, both culturally and geographically. During the past five years, I have served as a legal advisor to the uh, panel of eminent African personalities who are engaged in the Kenya National Di Dialogue and Re Reconciliation. This is chaired by Kofi Annan. And uh, one situation that struck me in that context was that the issues relating to indigenous populations and land can be very, very similar in countries far apart. When I learned more about the Maasai population in Kenya, I saw similarities between the Maasai and the Sami population, the Sami people in my country. So the challenge in the situation we are discussing now is to strike a right balance to engage in discussions with the local population and in particular with emerging leaders. When I said that the first element among the four that in my view constitute the rule of law is democracy, I'm fully aware that democracy cannot always come first. It is absolutely necessary to engage in rule of law work even if there is no democracy. In such situations, it may be necessary to establish some kind of transitional government where leadership is entrusted to persons who command respect and confidence in broad layers among the population. When I'm discussing this situation with military and civilian personnel who are being trained for service in UN missions, I'm always stressing the importance of interaction with the local population and the imperative of identifying local leaders who may be suitable to take on leadership roles, be it centrally at the national level, in regions, or locally. And um, until, of course, a full-fledged democratic system is developed. Another major challenge in peace building is the attitude within religious or ethnic groups and tribes, not least in relation to empowerment of women, which is a critical component in peace building. I cannot stress this enough. Empowerment of women is one of the most important issues for the future. I'm sure that we are going to hear about this when we discuss the situation in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya. I always listen with great respect to colleagues uh, with experience from the field. There are certainly common denominators in peace building operations, but there are also differences that can be significant. What has struck me is that the tribal element is still very much at the forefront in Africa. By way of example, the main reason for the post-election violence in Kenya in, early 2000, in 2007 and early 2008 was tribalism. An important element in coordinating rule of law work in peace building is to identify the actors and who is best placed to assist in different uh, um, activities. The assistance from states and international organizations is an obvious component. However, I always stress the important contributions by the business community and the non-governmental organizations. With respect to the business community, the global compact and corporate social responsibility should be borne in mind. As a matter of fact, there could be situations where a sensitive and responsible approach on the part of the business community can actually contribute to preventing conflict. In this field, we have seen a tremendous development uh, after or since Kofi Annan launched the Global Compact uh, way back in 1999. The non-governmental organizations provide a multifaceted group of actors that can assist in similar ways. In this context, we should never forget that the rule of law is not limited to activities by the police or prosecutors or the judiciary. On the contrary, in um, uh, developed societies, most people acting in the rule of law field, for example, as decision makers in applying existing legislation, are not even lawyers. Um, and uh, this is how it should be. When I realized that Achim uh, uh, Wenemann the executive coordinator of the Geneva Peace Building Platform would be here uh, and uh, participating. It struck me that I should mention here that in May this year, there was a conference organized in uh, Geneva by the Dag Hammarskjöld Foundation and the Geneva Peace Building Platform. 
they convened a group of uh, peacebuilding experts and um, uh, they uh, discussed various uh, challenges, in particular lessons on inclusivity in peacebuilding processes. And they um, uh, shared uh, real life experiences from Kenya, Somalia, Burundi, Nepal, Guatemala, Iraq, and other areas. And some key points actually attracted my attention. And I would like to reiterate these four points here. First of all, there is a need for generating greater buy-in among decision makers for bringing inclusivity to the center of peace building processes. Number two, it is important to find a balance in engaging with the state, civil society, and communities when supporting peace building. One set of actors should not be prioritized over the others. Number three, International actors need to recognize that their role should be limited to one of the catalysts and facilitator in peace building processes at the local and national level. And fourthly, multiple peace building processes are needed simultaneously at different levels in order to achieve sustainable peace. I'm sure that these elements will be very interesting for us to ponder upon today. Finally, in this context, there is also another critical element, namely the challenge for those at the receiving end to accept the assistance in an organized manner. For a lawyer with experience from the legislative field, it is obvious that even in a modern, well-organized democracy, there is a limit to how much, for example, a national legislative assembly can deal with at one at the same time. This difficulty is multiplied in a situation where, by definition, the receiving end is in the process of organizing itself and is very vulnerable. This means that there is a need for sensitivity within the donor community, and it is important that in a peace building situation, assistance is organized in a manner that the receiving end is not overburdened. Let me now turn to the United Nations and the rule of law. Suffice it to say, at the outset that this question has attracted tremendous attention within the organization over the last few years, notably after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The matter has been on the agendas both of the General Assembly and the Security Council for a long time. Much could be said about this topic and all the work that has been done in this field. However, in this brief keynote speech, I would like to focus first on the latest development and then on another element that is of crucial importance for the credibility uh, of the United Nations and its ability to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to quote the preamble of the UN Charter. Namely, the way in which the Security Council discharges its mandate under the Charter. The latest development with respect to the rule of law in the United Nations is the declaration adopted by the General Assembly on the 24th of September last year, the high-level meeting. Declaration on the Rule of Law at the National and International Levels. In this declaration, the members of the United Nations reaffirm their solemn commitment to the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, international law and justice, and to an international order based on the rule of law, which are indispensable foundations for a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world. Exact quote from the declaration. They recognize that the rule of law applies to all states equally, and that all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to just, fair, and equitable laws, and are entitled, without any discrimination, to equal protection of the law. They also reaffirm that human rights, the rule of law, and democracy are interlinked and mutually reinforcing. They emphasize the importance of the rule of law as one of the key elements of conflict prevention, peacekeeping, and conflict resolution, and in particular, peace building, and stress that justice, including transitional justice, is a fundamental building block of sustainable peace in countries in conflict and post-conflict situations. They also reaffirm that states shall abide by their obligations under international law. I never fail to stress, including in specifically the United Nations Charter, because under its uh, Article 103, it trumps actually other international agreements if there would be a conflict. 
As I said in another context, this is a very clear message indeed. But what counts is that the members of the United Nations now live up to what they have declared so that the declaration does not become empty words. The Western democracies must take the lead by demonstrating that they do live up to the undertakings in the declaration. On the 14th of December last year, the General Assembly adopted another resolution that should be mentioned here too, the rule of law at the national and international levels. In addition to recalling the 24 September declaration, the resolution contains many important elements to be borne in mind in general. And more specifically, it stresses the importance of restoring confidence in the rule of law as a key element in transitional justice. The second element in this part of my presentation, namely the way in which the Security Council discharges its mandate under the UN Charter, is, in my opinion, of fundamental importance. Therefore, I keep reiterating my criticism in the hope that others will join so that those responsible at the highest level among the permanent five members of the Security Council will finally demonstrate the necessary statesmanship and make a change before it is too late. Let me point to the present situation in Syria as an example of the shortcoming. In a letter to the governments of the members of the United Nations of 10 December 2008, under the title Security Council Reform, rule of law more important than additional members, I suggested that the five permanent members of the Council should make a solemn declaration of the kind that would be binding under international law. And in this declaration, they should pledge four things. First, to scrupulously adhere to the obligations under international law that they have undertaken, and in particular those laid down in the Charter of the United Nations. Second, to make use of their veto power in the Security Council only in their most serious indirect national interests are affected, and to explain, in case they do use this power, the reasons for doing so. Number three, to refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state unless in self-defense in accordance with Article 51 of the Charter or in accordance with a clear and unambiguous mandate by the Security Council under Chapter 7. And fourth, to take forceful action to intervene in situations when international peace and security are in threatened by governments that seriously violate human rights or fail to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, or when otherwise the responsibility to protect is engaged. The first three pledges that I suggested three, four, five years ago now fall squarely within the framework of an international society under the rule of law as defined by the General Assembly on the 24th of September last year. The fourth pledge relates to the summit outcome document of September 2005, where the General Assembly declared that we are, quote, prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter, including Chapter 7, on a case-by-case -case basis and in cooperation with relevant regional organizations as appropriate should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities are manifestly failing to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity." Unquote. This provision was reaffirmed by the Security Council in Resolution 1674 in April 2006. Taking the present situation in Syria as an example, the sad conclusion must be that the Security Council has failed miserably. As I have suggested on a previous occasion, if the Council, already at the outset, had sent a strong, unanimous message to the parties that what is happening in Syria is totally unacceptable in modern day society, maybe the tragedy in Syria could have been avoided. Mel van Adelsen just made a reference to the events in the Peace Palace yesterday, this wonderful building symbolizing justice, international justice. There, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon made a plea, 
a very strong plea to the Security Council to explore all diplomatic options to bring all Syrian parties to the negotiating table, stressing that there is no uh, 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 military solution to the crisis. This is what the Security Council should have done at the very outset of the conflict. And the question I ask myself, had they followed this advice that I tried to convey five years ago, maybe Syria could have avoided. And the mayor also said prevention. This is precisely what this means. If the members of the council could send the signal to the world that we will join hands in these situations and we will act, that would be the best way of preventing conflicts that the council otherwise would have to be dealing with. So the question I asked is, where is the next Syria? It could be anywhere where democracy and the rule of law are absent. Addressing the situation in Syria as it is now is addressing the symptoms of what is wrong, the inability of the permanent members of the Security Council to demonstrate statesmanship and exercise their duty under the Charter in a responsible manner. They have the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Finally, and now on a positive note, I, it gives me great pleasure to mention a newly published booklet, Rule of Law, a Guide for Politicians. This deliberately short guide is only some 40 pages. It's a joint effort by the Hague Institute of Internationalization of Law and the Raoul Wallemey Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at the University of Lund, Sweden. And I recognize Sam Miller, the director of the Hague Institute here uh, in front of me. The original language of this guide is English, and it was drafted, the first draft, by Professor Ronald Janser here in the Netherlands. Now we have translations into Arabic, Bahasa Indonesia, Chinese, Farsi, French, German, Japanese, Portuguese, Romanian, Russian, Slovenian, Spanish, and Swedish. They are or will shortly be available on the websites of the institutes. Please use this guide in peace building. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very good morning. My name is Khaled Choudhury from International Human Rights Commission. I appreciate each and single word of yours, including the mayors, who simply pointed out that we, the, we will have to ask Washington, D.C., that we have to change the policies, influencing, pressing United, United Nations as our own organization. It's an international organization. And my question to you is, sir, Egypt, where is the United Nations when democratically elected President Mohammed Morsi's government was removed by the military junta? They started genocide of Egyptians, killing them brutally, burning their dead bodies, and we kept quiet. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is a very sad situation because I have many friends in Egypt. By the way, Nabil El Arabi, the Secretary General of the Arab League, uh, he was legal counsel in the Foreign Ministry in Cairo when I took up my uh, corresponding position in Stockholm. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Mohammed El Baradei was the legal counsel of the uh, agency in, um, in Vienna before he became the director after Hans Blix. We interacted then, and others. And uh, I'm just so desperate here what is happening. But this proves in a sense the point that it is extremely difficult to transform countries from dictatorships into democracies. And I must say that I was troubled because this was an elected president who came into power. At the same time, I was very surprised that a person uh, with this background, including a person who'd lived for many years in a Western country where he must have take an impression from the political discussions and so forth, would act in some ways as he did. 
So let us just pray that the situation will develop in a different direction. But surely I think the United Nations could do more. And this is precisely why I think the role of the Security Council is so important, that these major five powers, the, the uh, uh, permanent members, if they join hands, it would send a very important signal to the world. I'm Theo Kralt, um, Association of European Parliamentarians with Africa. Um, thank you very much for your thorough and well worked out uh, introduction and lecture. I have a question in relation to the last paragraph, uh, the role of the Security Council. Um, in fact, it's about behavior also, uh, and not only to law, but how to change uh, an attitude, uh, the enormous interests of Russia and China in uh, relation to Syria as they perceive it. Um, there is enormous international pressure, but nevertheless I agree with you that you, uh, in, in the way that you've said, we should have, uh, the Security Council should have taken this dec decision earlier, but how to change that behavior of very important and powerful states? Thank you. There, my answer would be a reference to the Interaction Council for former heads of state and government. Based then in Tokyo when I was advised, asked to advise them when they talked about restoring the rule of law, in which actually the nucleus, the seed for the rule of law guide, when they started asking themselves, do politicians know enough about their responsibility in relation to the rule of law? One of the elements in their communique of 2008 is that you must talk. You must talk to others. And in particular, you must talk to those with whom you have an argument. And this is what I lack here. And this is why I refer to statesmanship. I mean, what about the cave dweller mentality that you heard in the presidential debate here in the US some months ago, when reference was made to Russia as our number one geopolitical enemy? I mean, do we live in the 21st century? So it's necessary that the leaders of these countries actually sit down and talk to each other, reason about this. And the question they should ask is, is it really acceptable that because we have secondary political interests here and there, that we allow women and children to be bombed away or maybe even gassed away here? Should we not take the responsibility and say, this is where we draw the line? If a dictator, if a warlord starts killing his or her, no, his own people, then we will intervene. So what I lack here is actually statesmanship. Well, me, we have uh, to make a break here, but maybe I will go back as far as 2,500 years ago. Let me quote the final choir in Sophocles' Antigone, where the king has destroyed everything and his children are dead and everything there, and the choir chimes in. Wisdom is a supreme part of happiness, and reverence for the gods is a must. But on mighty men, with mighty words in their mouths, the gods will strike with mighty blows, and teach in old age the chastened to be wise. As I said in Oxford a couple of years ago, why is it so difficult to transfer wisdom from one generation from an to another? And we should transfer the wisdom or by those who drafted the UN Charter into the present generation, they seem to have forgotten the reason why the UN Charter was drafted. It was drafted by a generation that had experienced two world wars. Thank you. Actually, I think that's an excellent note. Thank you so much, Hans, for, uh, should I say, stimulating and wise remarks. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.